The Justice of Joseph Revisited by Monsignor Arthur B. Calkins Of all the pericopes which form the infancy narratives in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, perhaps none has a wider ranging history of interpretation among Orthodox Christians than Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. It deals with what is often referred to as the doubt of Joseph, although even that terminology presupposes a particular mindset with regard to the event narrated. A fairer, less biased approach to the data would be to speak of the hesitation of Joseph, or even his dilemma, about what he should do vis-a-vis -vis Mary and her child, as we shall see. But even these descriptions, perhaps, fail to characterize adequately the motives of Joseph who, in Matthew's account, is simply, but with great precision, styled the just man. Whereupon Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing publicly to expose her, was minded to put her away privately. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 19. All of the major interpretations of this episode, from the patristic era to the present, fall into three categories agreed upon by virtually all the analysts. These categories are the hypothesis of adultery, the hypothesis of suspended judgment, and the hypothesis of reverential fear. We will first discuss the hypothesis of adultery. In order to accept this interpretation, which seems to be all but universal, at least in North America at this point in time, one must make an assumption that is not strictly warranted by the text. The assumption is that when St. Matthew states, quote, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. He is inviting the reader or hearer to know the source of Mary's pregnancy, of which Joseph at the time was ignorant. Father Raymond E. Brown serves as a modern apologist for this position. In fact, he translates this verse, It was found that she was with child, dash, through the Holy Spirit. And he further explains, I have separated this expression by a dash in order visually to mark it off as an explanation that Matthew offers to the reader. The fact that the child was conceived through the Holy Spirit is not part of the narrative flow here. Rather, that news comes to the dramatis personae from an angel's revelation in verse 22. But Matthew wants the reader to know more than do the characters in the story, so that the reader will not entertain for a moment the suspicion that grows in Joseph's mind. This assumption, in fact, has very ancient roots and is already found in the apocryphal Proto-Evangelium of James, which was composed prior to 200 AD, possibly even by a few decades. Here are the salient features of that text. Now it was a sixth month with her, and behold, Joseph came from his building, and he entered into his house, and found her great with child. And he smote his face, and cast himself down upon the ground on sackcloth, and wept bitterly, saying, What countenance shall I make concerning this maiden? For I received her out of the Lord my God, a virgin, and have not kept her safe. Who is he that hath ensnared me? Who hath done this evil in mine house, and hath defiled the virgin? And Joseph arose from off the sackcloth, and called Mary, and said unto her, O thou that was cared for by God, why hast thou done this? Thou hast forgotten the Lord thy God. And Joseph said, If I hide her sin, I shall be found fighting against the law of the Lord. And if I manifest her unto the children of Israel, I fear lest that which is in her be the seed of an angel, and I shall be found delivering up innocent blood to the judgment of death. Interestingly, this text, which begins with Joseph inferring violence toward Mary, or adultery on her part, moves to his entertainment of the possibility of Mary's conception by the seed of an angel, which properly moves into the second hypothesis, as we shall see. It certainly casts the justice of Joseph in a strange light, while providing an apt illustration of the beauty and sobriety of the canonical Gospels when compared with their apocryphal counterparts. 
we also find the hypothesis of adultery held most probably even prior to the Proto-Evangelium of James by St. Justin Martyr in his dialogue with Trypho. This position was also given most powerful backing in the preaching of two of the great Western Fathers of the Church, St. Ambrose and St. Augustine, and by possibly the greatest father of the East, St. John Chrysostom. As Father Soto Cornola points out in the case of Ambrose, however, quote, it seems that from neither of the two places where the saint speaks of this question can his stand be deduced with absolute certainty, end quote. Nevertheless, in both his Liber Segunda Expositionis Evangelii Segundum Lucum and his De Institutione Virginis, he deals with the matter in ways that clearly assume this position, even if they are not intended as an explicit commentary on Matthew 1.19. Soto Cornola argues similarly with regard to Augustine, that while Augustine assumes that St. Joseph suspected Our Lady of adultery, in the comments he makes, he never considered the question directly in itself or as an ex professo commentary on Matthew 119. The fact remains that St. Augustine made his position abundantly evident. The case of the position of St. John Chrysostom seems to be beyond dispute. In his fourth homily on St. Matthew, he preaches, Since he was just, that is merciful and self-controlled, he wished to dismiss her, privately. Not only was he reluctant to punish her, but he would not even deliver her up. Have you ever seen anyone who so loves wisdom and who is free from all tyrannical bent? He was so free from jealousy, this plague of the soul, that he refused to inflict pain on the virgin, even in the slightest degree. Accordingly, since it seemed that by law he was no longer permitted to keep her, and since it appeared that to denounce her and to bring her to trial was of necessity to condemn her to death, he chose neither course but began to elevate himself above the law. Yet on the other hand, Father Soto Cornola adduces two other texts of Chrysostom, one whose authorship is disputable, but the other of unquestioned authenticity, in which he seems to hold that Joseph knew of the supernatural origin of Mary's pregnancy. The Akithiosis hymn of the Greek Church, dating from the late 5th or early 6th century in its third Contechion, also accepts a hypothesis that Joseph suspected adultery. With such powerful liturgical reinforcement and the weight of such great fathers of the Church, this position was bound to become deeply embedded in the psyche of the faithful. It was implicitly manifested, for instance, in the mystical writings of Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich and Maria Valtorta. No other possible interpretation is even considered in the commentary offered in the authoritative Jerome Biblical Commentary. As we shall see further, each interpretation offered to explain the meaning of Matthew 1, 18-25 necessarily involves an understanding of how Joseph can rightly be described as a just man, according to Matthew 1.19. Death by stoning was prescribed by the Jewish law as punishment for a betrothed virgin and the man who committed adultery with her, although, as Canon McHugh argues with documentary evidence, quote, this was not obligatory and was not the practice in New Testament times, end quote. In any case, supporters of the adultery hypothesis usually opt for an understanding of Joseph's justice as being equivalent to obedience to the law. But there is a weakness in this theory. If Joseph's conduct is taken as evidence of legal observance, why did he not denounce Mary publicly instead of trying to conceal her guilt? Brown responds, Deuteronomy required the stoning of the adulteress, but in a less severe legal system, the command to purge the evil from the midst of you could have been met by divorcing her. In this interpretation, while Joseph's sense of obedience to the law forced him in conscience to divorce Mary, his unwillingness to expose her to public disgrace led him to proceed without accusation of serious crime. He was upright, but also merciful. There seems to be a certain inconsistency in accentuating Joseph's sense of legal justice in one breath and then tempering it in the next. 
St. John Chrysostom shows himself to be even more ingenious on this point by insisting that Joseph's obedience was so great that he transcended the law. I believe that Canon McHugh deals effectively with the question of Joseph's legal justice in the concomitant adultery hypothesis thusly. The first weakness of this interpretation is that it implies a certain conflict in Joseph's mind between the obligation of obeying the law and the desire to spare Mary's reputation. Yet the Gospel text contains no hint of any conflict. Matthew does not write, being an upright man, but not wishing to bring the matter into the open. On the contrary, the text reads, being an upright man and not wishing to bring the matter into the open, as if the two ideas were parallel, not contradictory. It was because of his integrity, not in spite of it, that Joseph wished to keep the divorce quiet. Secondly, there was no legal or moral obligation to divorce an unfaithful wife or fiancé. Indeed, the prophecy of Hosea implies that the husband who pardoned an errant wife would be closer to God. Thirdly, if Joseph had planned to keep the divorce secret in order to spare Mary's reputation, it would have been a singularly inept plan, for anyone should have realized that the story was bound to come out very soon. Matthew could not possibly have expected his readers to think this. But even beyond the necessary textual considerations, there are theological ones. Here are some framed by Father Bulbeck. God chose men who were not yet perfect for the spreading of the kingdom of grace, but he chose a perfect woman to cooperate in the hypostatic union. It would seem out of place for Joseph, who had been chosen by God to be the protector of Mary's virginity, himself to suspect that very thing. St. Peter Chrysologus says, The groom accused the bride of crime, but he himself was the witness of her innocence. He would call this a sin, but he himself was the guardian of her modesty. He would press the charge of adultery, but he himself was the one who guaranteed her virginity.